刷的刷牙，衣服还没换，吹吹头发，拍了脸颊。阿卡已经九点半，拿起手机，上了手提，戴起耳机，调动捷运，我飞奔，通过狗洞，坐上拥挤的电梯。怎么每天早八都在夜曲，都夜好痛？不是文少英文，就是体育。办公室应用，教授迷人的声音，引起言语，眼角放松，悠悠在悠悠的生活，没有悠悠就一卡通。换上蒸汽模样。展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不害怕。哦、或许偶尔会受伤，或许偶尔还会想。参加学会的社团的合唱的啦啦的一个一个玩，当上西南的西派的西帮的西会的每天埋头苦干，早上是罗西，晚上园艺，每个作息，四团如一，坚定不移 ，Let's go party， 我的桌一张起吃饱的地。妈妈说毕业后你到底想要干什么？我说我跟谁跟作业有属于我的天空。妈妈说你别傻的，老爸不是张忠谋。我接起电话，因为打篮球让我有点痛。像晨曦模样，展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不。痛，日子在过，我的人生不能如此怠惰。毕业后的生活会是如何？这个我也不好说，只是一定怀念啃妈妈的蒜泥白肉。我的小看期中期末考试的那没话做啊！人生儿女，亲生儿女，在选的日子几天而已。我冥冥之中穿到街火大方的勇敢学习。回头看好友的动态现实，忘记前女友的感伤措施，记不起老师的完整名字。我们就一起等未来方式。展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不害怕。哦、或许偶尔会受伤，或许偶尔还会想家。抬起头，我的朋友们，一起。
起床刷的刷牙，衣服还没换，吹吹头发，拍了脸颊。阿卡已经九点半，拉起手机，上了手机，戴起耳机，调到捷运，莫非奔冲过狗洞，坐上拥挤的电梯。怎么每天早八都在夜曲，都夜好痛。不是文少英文，就是体育，办公室应用，教授迷人的声音，引起言语，眼角放松，悠悠在悠悠的生活，没有悠悠，就一卡通。展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不害怕。或许偶尔会受伤，或许偶尔还会想家。抬起头，我的朋友们，一起走吧。参加学会了社团的合唱的啦啦的一个一个弯。上西南的西派的西方的西会的每天埋头苦干，早上是罗西，晚上元一，每个作息，四团如一，坚定不移 ，Let's go party， 我的桌一张起吃好的地。妈妈说毕业后你到底想要干什么？我说我跟谁跟作业有书评会的天空。妈妈说你别傻的，老板不是张忠谋。我接起电话，表达了，实在让我有点痛。幻想成寂寞。展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不害怕。哦、或许偶尔会受伤，或许偶尔还会想家。抬起头，我的朋友们，一起走。再痛，日子再过，我的人生不能如此怠惰。毕业后的生活会是如何？这个我也不好说，只是一点怀念。可妈妈的蒜泥白肉，我的小看其中期末考试的那没话做啊！人生儿女，亲生儿女，在选的日子几天而已。我冥冥之中穿到街火大方的勇敢学习，回头看好友的动态现实，忘记前女友的感伤丑事，记不起老师的完整名字，我们就一起到未来放肆。像晨曦模样，展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不害怕。哦、或许偶尔会受伤，或许偶尔还会想家。抬起头，我的朋友们，一起。
上几双刷的刷牙，衣服还没换，吹吹头发拍了脸颊。阿卡已经九点半，拉起手机，上了手机，戴起耳机，调到捷运，我飞奔冲过狗洞，坐上拥挤的电梯。怎么每天早八都在夜曲，都夜好痛。不是文上英文，就是体育，办公室应用，教授迷人的声音，引起言语，眼角放松，悠悠在悠悠的生活，没有悠悠，就一卡通。幻想着寂寞一样，展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不。参加学会的社团的合唱的啦啦的一个一个玩，当上西南的西派的西方的西会的每天埋头苦干，早上是罗西，晚上袁一，每个作息，事成如意，见你不易 ，Let's go party， 我的桌椅在起吃好的地。妈妈说毕业后你到底想要干什么？我说我跟谁跟作业有属于我的天空。妈妈说你别傻的，老爸不是张忠谋。我接起电话，电话打来却让我有点痛。展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不害怕。哦、或许偶尔会受伤，或许偶尔还会想家。抬起头，我的朋友们、啊，一起走。再痛，日子再过，我的人生不能如此怠惰。毕业后的生活会是如何？这个我也不好说，只是一定怀念啃妈妈的蒜泥白肉。我的小看期中期末考试的那没话做啊！人生儿女，先生儿女，在选的日子几天而已。我冥冥之中穿到街火大方的勇敢学习，回头看好友的动态现实，忘记前女友的感伤措施，记不起老师的完整名字，我们就一起到未来放肆。像穿起模样，展翅的我们就要飞翔，梦想在远方，但我从不。
卡式炒鸡居啊。Hello everyone. Uh, please download Slido Slido dot com and convert and carry your questions. We will have Q and A for the whole session. Thank you. No speech. That's your opportunity. Yeah. just 15 minutes uh, and so my talk will be crowdsourced meaning that you will uh, help me to curate the agenda so if you can scan the QR code that would be best uh, if you somehow cannot scan the QR code if you're using a laptop you can also go to slido.com and enter 00518 uh, without a pound sign uh, whether it's by scanning QR code or by entering slido.com 00518 you get into this chat room ish thing uh, where people can ask me any question and also more importantly you can like each other's questions so the question with the most number of like will float to the top uh, and at the moment the top is just two likes uh, and so I would encourage you to to like each other more I guess sorry like each other's questions more, uh, and uh, see if uh, we can get uh, more questions here so for the next 15 minutes I'll just begin from the top uh, and if any of you would like to uh, ask additional questions uh, as part of uh, my answer uh, you can raise your hand and start speaking at any uh, given time uh, the speaking uh, always has a higher priority uh, than the slido so that's the time structure if that's okay with you folks okay it's okay all right so let's get started right so um six people would like to know this question uh posed by an italian um, quote how do you prevent disinformation campaign from interfering with your work 
Um, first of all, I would like to share this very simple idea called the basic transmission rate, or R0. Uh, I'm sure that all of you probably have heard of this uh, important number by now. Uh, that is to say, uh, if you receive a virus, uh, how many more people uh, a person who received the virus will infect? If the R0 value uh, is under 1, it means that it would not become an epidemic because it was just uh, taper off. And if it is above 1, it means that on average, every Every person spread to more than one person and then it will gradually grow exponentially uh, and so we basically use the same public health metaphor uh, in order to look at the disinformation um, crisis. Now uh, in Taiwan we, we have a pretty narrow definition of disinformation. It's a legal definition and it's called intentional untruth that harms the public not just the image of a minister, which may just be good journalism, uh, but harming the public's health. And, and that is the, the kind of thing that uh, we look into how to counter in a rapid fashion. And when you analyze that, you will find that most of the information that has, that goes viral, meaning that uh, it goes online in a uh, R0 value that's larger than one, uh, probably all have a the same um, emotional content. I'll just use a couple of examples. Um, for example, here's an example here. Um, all right. So there was this disinformation uh, campaign uh, last um, in January, I think. So around the voting time. And it started uh, going viral uh, just the day before the election. And it says the CIA, it's always the CIA, made two special invisible ink for ballots. So if you vote for Dr. Tsai, uh, your, your ink will stay. But if you vote for the other two candidates, your, your ink will, will disappear. Uh, and uh, if you vote for other uh, candidates, uh, there will be an invisible ballot count for, for Dr. Tsai, which will magically appear so that everybody will end up voting for Dr. Tsai, regardless of who you actually voted. And now this uh, goes viral partly because it appeals to the emotion of outrage. Uh, if people see a conspiracy theory like this and they bought into it before they have even the time to fact check or to um, think through uh, how would that even chemically work, um, they will tend to spread to a few people and after they realize that there's no way this could, this could chemically work, it is already too late because it's already infected more than one person and that's why it goes viral. Uh, and so the way we counter it is through radical transparency, essentially inviting YouTubers to live stream the counting process. So if you're here during the election, uh, you'll probably see quite a few YouTubers uh, just uh, having this kind of cameras. And the people who count the ballots just put it up high so that uh, the YouTubers with all sorts of different cameras, just like we have, what, five cameras here, uh, can, can see the, all, the different, uh, all the different angles, uh, can see the counting process. So it naturally uh, made this uh, clarification transparency um, much more viral than the disinformation. So another example, there was again, uh, this is appeals to uh, panic buying. So uh, there was a rumor this uh, February that says, mask cannot be bought with money now. So a certain manufacturer sponsored 2,000 boxes of masks. You can, by commenting and sharing this social media post, receive a box of medical masks for free. Uh, and this, this appeals, of course, to, to people's uncertainty about the mask supply at the time. Of course, nobody who uh, comment and share this receive any mask. They receive instead computer virus. Uh, but uh, they, it uh, very successfully uh, have a R0 value that's above one, because on average, everybody who fall victim to this uh, would infect more than one friend of them to, to click share on the social media post. And so in a couple of days, uh, we rolled out a radical transparency plan that renders uh, this disinformation uh, useless because we published uh, as open data all the real-time availability information of all the masks in supply in your nearby ph pharmacies so everybody can see as a fact uh, who, uh, which pharmacist has how many, whenever you see there's a rumor, find a humorous way to dispel that rumor so that the rumor's uh, viral virality will be below one. So that's the basic idea. There's quite a few other examples I can give, but uh, let's go on to the next one. So, um, Chenault Monroe 
uh, would like to know um, how can Taiwan, and more specifically the digital ministry, help Taiwan's allies in developing its ICT technical skills to fight COVID-19? Excellent question. Um, so the mass map that I just showed actually um, is now used more in South Korea than in Taiwan because there's almost no queuing now. You just go to a random nearby pharmacy or nearby convenience store which open 24 hours and you're probably guaranteed to have uh, sufficient medical mask uh, in supply. Uh, but South Korea, uh, having um, nationalized the uh, mass economy slightly later than we do, a month later than we do, uh, still have need to uh, use the mask map. It's a very interesting Finally, uh, if you go to the mask um, map, the top one, this one with a lot of triangles, uh, it's uh, written by uh, someone with a um, nickname Qiang uh, or Jiang Mingzong uh, in Tainan. So when, whenever I open it, it focuses in Tainan, right? Uh, and uh, this shows our real-time availability up updated every three minutes. And despite knowing no uh, Korean language, uh, Qiang's implementation, this particular map, is actually the first map that is provided to the South Korean people when they started mass rationing. And so this tells us two things. First is that the open source community knows no boundaries. Anybody who uh, donates their code, that is to say, their algorithms and the way that the process works to the commons, that is to say, relinquishing most of the copyrights, uh, can be taken up by any other jurisdictions. There, it doesn't need to have a authorization, a MOU, a licensing ceremony, or anything like that. If this is useful, people will discover it and people will use it. So this is the transmission part. But there's also the mutation part. Uh, so if it's a good idea, uh, chances are that people will want to adapt that to uh, its particular circumstances. So this is the Tokyo dashboard. This is uh, in collaboration with the civic technology community, the Code for Japan. And very quickly, people saw that this is actually a much better visualization than the ones that were uh, in place. I used a lot of PDF files and tables and so on. And so people in Korea as well as in Taiwan started to translate it. So you can very easily see uh, a uh, Taiwanese Mandarin translation uh, or an English translation uh, and things like that. And so on GitHub, you can just look at this octocat uh, and see that how many versions there are. And you will see that there's almost 2,000 versions. Um, and each version gives it a little bit difference uh, and changes it a little bit. For example, my version uh, changes the, the zenti zhongwen, the, the t here this single character uh, from its original kind of simplified strokes into um, its original shape. And that's the only thing, literally the only thing that I changed uh, in my branch. Uh, but when I changed that uh, branch, then the Code for Japan people very quickly merged it in so that you can see this now reflected in all the different versions of this dashboard. And then a city councilor noticed that and thanked me. And then that triggered the mayor of Tokyo <laughs> noticing that and thanking me on Twitter. And so again, this is not trying to diplomacy or the third sector now. Uh, we call it the social sector and the civic technology community. It just ho so happened that one of the civic technologies happens to be Taiwan's digital minister. But uh, my proposal gets included by its merit, not because I'm Taiwan's digital minister. This is not your traditional track one diplomacy. Uh, this is because this contribution actually makes sense and also makes it much more easily for the different jurisdictions to start uh, comparing oranges to oranges uh, in terms of evaluating, for example, whether to reopen the borders and things like that. We really require the same degree of transparency and accountability so that uh, we can calculate uh, the risk factors involved. And so uh, this is uh, very important diplomatically, but this collaboration is not, not done by a diplomatic channel. Rather, this is by people collaborating in the open, through the open innovation um, ecosystem. And so this uh, South Korean and Japanese um, collaborate my staff and essential work is also data driven risk communication. Um, and so a lot of people across the world uh, proposed different digital systems here and we uh, use a novel um, voting to, to to look at and this is important because uh, different societies have different norms and it's important to look at the society different norms and then settle on the common values that makes sense for all the different uh, societies and different norms. For example, one of the US proposals uh, from the US side used to be that uh, we need to build an AI uh, tool for the ICU, for the um, 
uh, intensive care unit so that if they get swamped uh, with people going to the ICU, instead of uh, admitting them on a first come, first serve basis, uh, we should evaluate their remaining life contribution potential to the society and uh, take care of the people with higher remaining um, life potential. Uh, and this is illegal in Taiwan. Taiwan actually has a law that explicitly forbids this kind of evaluation. So our National Development Council uh, Regulatory Reform Unit actually did a uh, red light, yellow light, green light to each and every crowdsource proposals so that people can see uh, that we need to focus on the things that uh, has no legal disputes or at least agree with the local norm but uh, can be interpreted to be within the legal uh, norm instead of wasting, sorry, uh, spending time uh, to work on the things that are uh, both violating the social norm and is actually downright illegal. And this is also important. Uh, otherwise, uh, the society's norm may gradually change because of the epidemic. But that is what we want to conserve. We want to uh, be still a liberal democracy. And we have never uh, in Taiwan declared an emergency situation. So everything we do needs to still be constitutional and within the rule of law and giving a accountable a reason, of a scientific reason also, of why we do such things. And so the five winning teams uh, will be announced uh, later today. And so I would encourage you to look at uh, what they have to offer. And they also offer their source code uh, under open source licenses, meaning that they relinquish most of their copyright, uh, including for commercial purposes. So if you're interested uh, in coding or in design, uh, you can also take their idea and run with it and see if it can also help uh, to assist um, your country um, in developing the ICT technical skills. This is all um, just time can help. This is not about uh, charging any um, license fees or trademark fees. So five people would like to know, how does the digital ministry help Taiwan achieve its sustainable development goals? Excellent question. Um, so we, we again, uh, have any number of hackathons. And so this is the, the presidential hackathon. The co-hack is kind of a fast-tracked one within the presidential hackathon. Uh, both are run by the uh, Board of Science and Technology. But the presidential hackathon is much more, uh, it encompasses pretty much everything. So these are the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals. And each proposal in a presidential hackathon need to correspond to one or more of the specific uh, goals in the SDGs. So that people can look at the SDGs and uh, the more than 200 proposals in it and choose the ones that make sense to them. And we use a novel voting method called quadratic voting that makes sure that people don't get mobilized to vote just one thing, but rather can evaluate the synergies between the sustainable development goals. And so um, just a few examples of the previous winners of the presidential hackathon. So um, each presidential hackathon uh, each year chooses five teams. And for example, there was a team called the Water Savior, because they save water. Uh, and this is a Taiwan Water Corporation. Uh, they employ a lot of people who listen to the pipes for leaks. And if it's not leaking, they go on to listen to the next part of the pipeline. And if they do leak, then they uh, become creative and start finding solutions to the leaks. Now, uh, they partnered two years ago with a bunch of uh, machine learning experts so that they train a, a kind of um, apprentice uh, chatbot so that the uh, skills persons can wake up and on the chatbot on the line platform uh, look at the three most likely leaking places near them and so they spend their time fixing those leaks rather than discovering the places that are not leaking which is a very trivial kind of work and, and do not actually recruit very well for young people to join but in any case uh, the young people are now much more willing to join because most of their time is spending doing creative endeavor instead of listening to pipes that are not leaking. And so just this very simple idea, they correspond to one uh, sustainable goal, uh, that is to say the target 6.4, increase water use efficiency and ensure fresh water supplies. So they receive a trophy from our president. Now there is no money, uh, no monetary reward uh, in the presidential hackathon. Rather, uh, this trophy, which is the shape of Taiwan, I guess I need to draw the shape a little bit more Taiwan-like, I guess I'm never very good at drawing that sort of shape. 
It's still nothing like Fanta, but anyway, more like an ice cream or something. But anyway, so um, the important part is this microprojector underneath it. If you turn on the microprojector, then it shows Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing the trophy to you. Uh, and so this is a self-descriptory uh, trophy. And it basically says that the president promises whatever you have prototyped in the past three months, according to the system of the goals, we're committed to realize whatever you're doing in the next 12 years, uh, sorry, 12 months, uh, 12 months, and next one year as part of the national policy. And so no matter whether it is about uh, fixing the water pipes leaks or to uh, build data collaboratives to measure the air and also now water quality together and so on, uh, every year we have hundreds of cases that proposes to make a cross-sectoral data collaborative that makes people trust each other more and realize uh, the SDGs uh, more. And this by itself is a sustainable development goal. This is education for sustainable development and global citizenship just by measuring your um, balcony or your school's uh, PM 2.5 air quality volume and writing it into a distributed ledger. Uh, this actually increases people's awareness that we're collectively responsible for the data collection um, work that uh, can shape the, our environmental policies together. And because the environment minister uh, at the time of that um, proposal only had less than 100 uh, measurement stations and the civil society already has more than 2,000 uh, and in Taiwan we cannot censor them, right? So we, we cannot be them with us join them. Uh, and so they negotiated with the environment minister, allowing the government to support or not control their uh, monitoring network to calibrate uh, its um, sensitivity and so on. And they negotiated so that the government will help fill in the gaps. The gaps are usually industrial parks that um, are private property. They can't break in into and install air boxes there. But it turns out that the public sector owns the lamp. Uh, in the in industrial park. And so we can um, basically take their micro uh, sensor design and put it on the lamp and then complete the picture together. And so all of this, um, this says that all the industrial park developments, and for example, this one is about um, plants, um, agricultural plants, and how it cannot be influenced by pollutions by the industrial plants uh, near the arable lines. And again, this is a uh, micro sensor that you could just put on the uh, irrigation uh, pathway, and it would just automatically calculate the pollution level of the three most common pollutants and write it uh, through the MBIOT or other uh, zero-G network into a distributed ledger so that everybody who is a farmer can just very cheaply get those boxes and measure the upstream pollution. And the upstream uh, manufacturers, if they are not polluting, they will also be incentivized to get a few of such cheap boxes and prove that it's even upstream that has pollution because we have passed a law that anyone who uh, on arable land pollutes the uh, plants, they uh, will get their electricity and their water supply cuts uh, by the Ministry of uh, Economy Affairs. And so this, again, is a very important uh, way to build sustainability right into the kind of fabric of the society. Now the voting method uh, is also very interesting. Everybody uh, gets 99 points uh, with, if they have joined the GOV, the TW, the um, participation platform uh, accounts. There's more than 10 million visitors out of 23 million residents in Taiwan. Um, and everybody received 99 points. And if you like this uh, idea a lot, you can vote for uh, one vote, which costs one point, two votes, which costs four points, three votes, which costs nine points, up to nine point uh, votes, which costs 81 points, because you only have 99. Um, after voting for nine votes, you still have 18 left, but you cannot cast the tenth vote, because that would be uh, costing 100, and nobody has 100. So people will be prompted to look into other more interesting or equally interesting ideas and spend the 18 points maybe voting for four, uh, which costs 16. And people are then motivated to look at the other two because people don't want to squander their votes. And then maybe they take some of the original nine back and do a seven and seven and so on. And so on average, uh, each uh, project, instead of receiving all of the uh, nine votes, on average, people just do a, a seven and seven or a four and four and things like that. On average, uh, people vote for more than four. Uh, projects. And the important uh, result is that when we announce the top 20, everybody will feel that they have won, almost everybody. Instead of if they over-concentrate, then almost everybody will feel they have lost uh, when we announce the top 20. So this is also 
the way, using mechanism design to build uh, the social consensus. So presidential hackathon is one of the primary ways because if they win the presidential hackathon, even if uh, by realizing the sustainable goals they break some existing laws or they require a lot of extra budget or so on, they have their presidential promise that this will happen uh, and uh, they will uh, be much more able to convince their ministers to change the laws and things like that if they say, oh, we cannot do that, we cannot um, using pure teleconference to get uh, special doctors to look at the offshore islands nurses uh, cases. Uh, they previously always require a fly via the helicopter to the main Taiwan island for treatment of serious cases and major trauma. Uh, but through the presidential hackathon, they proved that the local people will be much more happy if the nurses uh, locally can talk with the specialized doctors. Uh, and uh, the, the local nurses and doctors also learn more uh, because they will be able to treat these uh, issues uh, through the instructions from the people who are uh, in the main Taiwan island. Uh, and so because it's such a good idea, even if it's not legal by the um, law of um, doctors at that time, uh, the legislation very quickly pushed through an amendment that made this uh, legal. And so this is the political binding power is one of the primary ways uh, that we realized the SDG through this kind of uh, annual crowdsourcing. So eight people would like to know, uh, do I think social enterprises uh, will be a booming industry in Taiwan in the next 10 years and why? Yes, certainly. Uh, because in Taiwan, uh, we already now say that whenever you're developing for economy, not only you need to uh, prove that you're not causing environmental and social harm, which would be um, a company's social responsibility, but rather we much prefer uh, people to focus, for example, on circular economy and eco-design, that is to say it can deliver environmental value of being carbon neutral or even negative uh, carbon uh, when they uh, promote the good jobs and economic growth. That is to say, um, we now uh, deliver much of the values by proving that it, it's not an either or thing, this is not a zero something, but rather uh, by, for example, um, banning the plastic straws of our national identity drink bubble tea. I mean, takeouts, um, that's, that's by itself a crowdsource proposal. Um, people would brainstorm on all sorts of different ways, uh, not only the obvious solutions such as uh, a transparent glass based straw, but rather uh, using uh, agric um, materials that used to be um, um, exhaust uh, or, or garbage, uh, but they, they, they can transform these organic uh, materials in a uh, low or even negative carbon way uh, into reusable straws. And uh, a lot of new designs uh, out of the circular economy uh, trend um, makes people's preferential shopping, or what we call buying power, a very um, serious um, incentive for the businesses to start developing in an eco-friendly way. Previously, the businesses know that if they uh, put the food safety in danger, put environmental safety in danger, uh, people in Taiwan will do a social sanction, and the social sanction is very serious, right? It can just take down pretty much any company. But, but now, uh, a lot more companies are using crowdfunding platforms, such as Flying Bee or Zozo, uh, to advertise their pro-social and pro-environment um, lines, and even though it may have a higher initial cost uh, because it requires research and development, people are willing to burden themselves with some of this initial uh, research and development cost by participating in crowdfunding, and we see a clear growth uh, in these areas, specifically around circular economy, but also about, uh, for example, the life under ocean or a um, clean water and sanitation mitigating against um, climate change and things like that. These are all pretty uh, good topics when it comes to crowdfunding. So I think it will not only be a booming industry, it will change the industrial norm. Uh, for public listed companies, there's already uh, a majority of them are now, instead of writing a purely CSR report, they are now writing a sustainability strategy report uh, using the international GRI standards. And uh, in the coming years, we will probably see that because the know-how um, gets more widely known uh, by the accountants and by the people doing those uh, GRI reports, even small to medium enterprises will find it to their advantage to do the same thing as the publicly listed company did, which is to prove that the more business that you do with them, uh, the more more environmental and social value do they deliver. So if you want to look at the 400 or so uh, early adopters uh, to this idea, you can look into social innovation platform si.taiwan.gov.tw, uh, which lists exactly which registered organizations in which sustainable development goals, which yes, they are registering what issues they are solving, uh, and the 
challenges locally that they are looking at. And you can also um, look at nearby vicinities and see which SDGs get a focus by the local voluntary national reviews and local voluntary local reviews of that municipality and so on. And so each municipality will also develop its own SDG strategy to announce to the entrepreneurs working on those issues uh, that they would then um, absorb much of the risk if they try out a few different things and fail, sorry, and pivot uh, to other things. And the municipality will absorb most of the cost because they will uh, be aligning uh, to whatever the municipality is SDG targets are, and everything that they learned will be very um, informative to the policy makers in that municipality. And so that is why I think it is not just women, it's redefining the industry. So eight people would like to know what are some examples of global partnerships uh, that Taiwan have? Excellent question. Um, so like in the Open Government Partnership, which is a global organization with more than, I think, 80 uh, countries and many uh, important um, civil society organizations such as Transparency International and so on, um, they open contracting partnership and so on. Uh, they work with us very closely so that uh, in Taiwan we have a national action plan that is currently in the works that uh, shares how exactly we're opening up each and every part of our government so that people can participate more widely in it. And this is called the National Action Plan of the Open Government Partnership. Um, and the OGP is a very interesting place because um, I personally shared um, many keynotes and panels in the OGP. And the OGP, uh, for example, this is when I shared the impact assessment uh, co-creation process using gender impact assessment as a framework. Uh, of course, this has this banner tweet, uh, which is very appropriate now that we are in the anniversary uh, of the marriage equality. Um, but um, behind this uh, is actually 12 years of very intensive open government work. And so I explained first that our national parliament's gender uh, parity uh, is pretty good. I was presenting in Canada, Canada so um, I just used Canada in nearby countries. I probably wouldn't have this slide if I presented in Nordic countries. But in any case, we're now above 30% um, women in the parliament. And we have a structure called the uh, Gender Equality Committee that is by design one more seat of the civil society leaders than ministers. But most ministers are also part of the uh, Gender Equality Committee. And each and every um, bills and projects, there's hundreds of them um, every year, gets um, measured by this gender impact assessment so that every ministry, every public servants uh, have a theory of change of how their policies are going to change the, the gender um, equality landscape. And this measures not only the very uh, top level, this is actually like number of volunteers, community development association members, um, labor force participation rate, uh, all the way to uh, like uh, civil servants in different levels and things like that. And every bill need to complete this assessment. For example, this one is from uh, Ministry of Labor. Uh, that's how it solves the problem, even though it's ostensibly not related to gender, um, how it would actually uh, influence the gender landscape when its policy goal uh, become implemented, and uh, how would um, like re-employee women and foreign workers be implemented, and what are the consultation, the open government processes, uh, and what are the benefits, and so on. And as soon as they declare that, those numbers are now uh, then listed into the gender dashboard and constantly monitored, even long after this plan goes out of uh, scope uh, out of its uh, expiration year. So that means that we have a constantly monitored um, numbers uh, of uh, the human right impact, the civil and political right impact, and so on across uh, all the different uh, government sectors. So after 12 years of running this, all civil servants, even in the um, initially, they would think it's unrelated issues uh, such as finance or whatever other planning, they will link their main work with gender and proactively discover gender-related issues. And that is why as soon as the Constitutional Court uh, did this ruling and the two referenda sets the solutions Escape. Um, the civil servants immediately came up with the, the kind of very 
tiny solution space uh, came up with the, the perfect solution, uh, so-called the hyperlink act, uh, and also uh, what I call in um, marrying the uh, by-laws but not the in-laws, uh, which is a marriage equality with Asian characteristics, uh, and that then gets uh, legalized because then uh, it weds people together but not families uh, together, and that very neatly uh, satisfies both referenda and also the cash Support and issues and also marriage equality and, and because they've never thought that it is possible to kind of shortcut uh, the, the kinship and family system and, and change nothing on that part on, of the civil code but everything uh, of the bylaws and the rights and obligations uh, on the um, marriage part of the civil code. Uh, a lot of them are now explicitly uh, modeling their campaigns uh, after Taiwan's design. So I would say that this qualifies as uh, a very important uh, global partnership horizon and really I think the, the process upon how the public servants discover the solution by themselves is as important uh, as the activists and the legislators uh, in this particular issue. So um, nine people uh, ask, how would uh, the digital ministry help to prevent future hacks like the one that occurred on the uh, presidential office over the weekend? Well, we do offer our uh, secure communication channels. Um, the Zoom. Uh, issue. I'm not sure whether you know of that issue. Uh, it is basically uh, when February, around February, uh, Zoom originally said that each conference uh, that took on the Zoom meeting platform will only uh, be transmitted to the data centers uh, within that particular region. They have this idea of geofencing, uh, but they say that uh, during February there was a spike in um, traffic, of course, because of coronavirus. So they mistakenly uh, missed configured uh, so that no matter where you are in the world, there are some chances that your um, key exchange traffic will um, go to the PRC territories for, for some reason. But in any case, they say it's a configuration mistake. Uh, but it is explicitly violated uh, their promise to their customers. And that is why our Department of Cybersecurity uh, banned it. Uh, banning it is not the problem. Finding alternative it is the problem because by that time, a lot of education facilities uh, have uh, settled on using food. Uh, for their communication and education. So um, in just, I think, uh, that in 20 hours or so, um, I personally set up, uh, extended our uh, offering of video conferencing from within uh, the, uh, originally only from my office and uh, our extended network, the participatory office and network, and we work with the National Center of High-Speed Computing and start offering this uh, GC Meet instance at meet.pdis.tw to pretty much everybody. So um, you can, uh, any of you, can, can use meet.pdis.tw uh, for free uh, and to, to immediately start setting up uh, video conferences uh, with one another uh, and have the National Center of High State computing absorb most of the, the traffic and actually all the cost. This is completely free uh, offering. Uh, and then we also work with the Department of Cybersecurity to do a penetration test to do a security audit of the system to make sure that there is no vulnerabilities if you decide to switch to this uh, from Zoom. And so basically what we do at the executive uh, run is just to try out these um, tools and do penetration testing and so on uh, and uh, improve its usability so that that people can use it uh, without feeling that they have to install an extra software, install an extra package, because every extra step decreases people's uh, incentive to use these secure systems. So our main work is just to make this as uh, convenient as the thing that is replacing, in this case, Zoom. Um, and so that's our main contribution. But I'm really not in charge of cybersecurity of the presidential office. Uh, and what we can do is just to, to kind of nudge uh, people, uh, especially um, officials, uh, to, to use this as convenient as insecure products, but more, in, more secure because it's cybersecurity tested uh, and somehow change their, their behavior patterns. And this is not very easy. Uh, I mean, I personally have not used mine for official purpose uh, for the past four years. But there's not many cabinet members that can say that uh, because uh, for each um, convenient but not very secure. Uh, I'm not saying that line is insecure. I'm saying that the way that people use line confusing their family communication with their official communication is not secure. Uh, so, but it's it's a hard habit to break. And so, a lot of social engineer doesn't really need to get to the core of the cybersecurity system. You just need to kind of socially 
uh, engineer convince uh, some uh, some person, for example, through free mask or whatever, <laughs> for them to, to download something, and then and voila, you have uh, the access to their address book uh, and things like that. So what we're doing is basically a demonstrating a more cyber um, secure uh, way of operating in the public sector, but at the end of the day, especially for higher level officials, it boils down to each and every one of them to wash their hands properly, uh, to <laughs> adhere to the good cybersecurity hygiene. So 10 people <laughs> would like to know, is anything being done to make sure that the data being used in track and contain um, COVID is not also being used in a malicious way, or that it won't be in the future? Excellent question. So um, the digital fence, which you probably already have heard of, uh, maybe some of your friends have been uh, going through the digital fence uh, that enforces the 14 day of self-quarantine or self-isolation, uh, is the main part that is controversial uh, in this uh, technology against COVID. Because um, in Taiwan, uh, during SARS, which is in 2003, um, people had to barricade an entire hospital, and it was very traumatic for everybody who remembered that. That is to say, anyone who happens to be around uh, at that time anyone who's above 30 years old and was living in Taiwan at the time. Uh, and so the Constitutional Court after SARS uh, took quite quite a few um, years uh, in legislation, in debates and so on, to try to figure out a proper way to rewrite our uh, CDA, our um, Communicable Disease Act, uh, to make sure that when SARS comes again, we don't have to barricade uh, the hospital. Even though barricading the hospital is not ruled as unconstitutional, the Constitutional Court um, may makes the request to the legislator so that they have to find something that has a fixed duration that doesn't um, hamper uh, the freedoms as much as a physical barricade uh, that it need to be clearly informed and not barricading unannounced and things like that. These are very important constraints. Uh, but so it authorized the CDA and therefore the CECC to implement now the digital fence, which is an alternate way than barricading people's homes. Rather, it uses the phone signals that people are addicted to their phones anyway to make sure that they do not uh, exceed the perimeter. And it doesn't use the GPS or any sort of uh, kind of fine-grained uh, details. He used cell tower triangulation so that it has a resolution of maybe 50 meters um, across 50 meters. Uh, and so if you break out of that square, uh, instead of it doesn't know which room you're in, for example, uh, then it triggers an SMS message to the local household managers and the police. And the important thing here is that it doesn't collect any new thing. The tri triangulation data, the signal strength data, the whereabouts of the phone basically is already tracked by the five telecoms. It's just that uh, they, instead of using it to improve their service only or implement roaming or whatever, uh, they instead use this as a notification system, but only during those 14 days. Uh, at the 15th day after you break out of the, um, the, the uh, 14 day period, there is no constitutional basis to retain any of the data or to use any of the data. And so uh, none of this is retained. Basically, the usual, uh, what we call log rotation, which is the deletion of the unnecessary monitoring of the data. So, in those systems, uh, all they track is the SMS numbers. And if the SSN numbers um, are given out by the government, of course, we also recycle those numbers uh, because these are temporary phones provided for the people in quarantine. So again, there's no a, a uh, kind of hard link relationship between that information and your personal identifiers after the quarantine is over. So a lot of it is very um, detailed, very technical, but precisely because not all people approve of this way of using um, cell phone information. And Oh, somebody said that I should talk more slowly. Okay, sure. So uh, anyway, so um, what I'm trying to get it uh, get to is that if people think that uh, it is not um, uh, a kosher way of using the data, that they will work with the MPs that have fears or uncertainty or doubt, and the MPs do uh, ask the Department of Cybersecurity and so on, uh, and the Zhonghua Telecom and so on, to the legislation to give an account of what exactly is being retained and what exactly will be deleted and things like that. And so um, even though I think uh, Minister uh, Chen Shizhong by now have 94% approval rate, uh, we, we need to remember that we, we owe the 6% <laughs> a lot because it's these 6% that keep us honest and accountable because we've not declared a emergency situation. 
literally every single administrative measure we take needs to be explained in terms of existing constitutional law system. So these 6% of people and the MPs that represent them that ask for a accountability for each and every new technological measures, that is the, the treasure of our constitutional liberal democracy because without which uh, it becomes a very arbitrary thing. So I think it will um, not be used in a malicious way precisely because uh, that we do not have 100 percent approval rates uh, of the CECC. Um, ten people would like to know, being uh, instrumental in Taiwan's coronavirus control efforts, what do I think is the most important thing to learn from other countries struggling with COVID-19? Excellent question. So for me, actually, the question that was just asked is really the most important question, um, because this changes the norm that we have around data. And you can either choose um, to have the civil society, um, as I showed, to monitor the data. We designed the system so that anyone can go to the pharmacy, swipe your NHI card, after a couple of minutes refresh the map or the chatbot, uh, and then see its stock deplete by 9 or by 10 if you're a child. And this is by design. Instead of um, having the government release the statistics or the audit reports at the end of the day or the end of the week, which will take away all the participatory power of the social sector, we release these numbers every 30 seconds at the beginning. And now it's not really queuing anymore, so we release every three minutes. But this near time, near real time uh, release of open data uh, shows enormous trust. We trust the citizens to not misuse these data, and we trust citizens to also inform us in policy in making, in making sure that data controllership is joined by everybody in the society. So there's a lot of people who volunteer to build analysis systems that not only visualizes the growing of the supply so everybody can see that there really is no need uh, to panic buy anymore, that we do have sufficient supply, but they can also highlight, uh, the, for example, the oversupply or undersupply of certain regions or certain activity patterns like in certain municipalities where people, especially young people, People work very long hours. Uh, they tend not to have time to go to the pharmacy because by the time their work is over, the, all the pharmacies have closed. Uh, and for these people, we of course work with the 24-hour uh, convenience stores and so on. So they are also co-collaborators in policy making. So this is what I call data collaboratives or a social sector-led uh, data policy. But in many other jurisdictions, something um, else is happening. Right? People are trusting the state, uh, a surveillance state, adapt to all the data without giving adequate explanation or the scientific basis of why the policies are made in such a way. And there is literally no way for people to validate whether it's, a good, it's, it's true or not. Right? So actually something very much like that is happening in Wuhan right now uh, with their um, like, uh, pervasive uh, retesting. Uh, and people are questioning, for example, uh, the efficacy of the testing equipment, the sequence of the retesting, um, the um, official numbers versus people's crowdsource numbers and things like that. And usually it, uh, it falls upon the journalism uh, community to make sense uh, of the various different uh, news sources and have a um, single account of everything. And in Taiwan, we partner with the journalism community by essentially allowing them a lot of co-creation power is, uh, for example, asking the CECC uh, what to do if a young boy refused to go to school because all they have uh, is pink medical mask uh, and they that he would get bullied uh, by his uh, classmates. Uh, and the CECC the very next day uh, puts on pink medical mask uh, and we see a lot of uh, Facebook and other social media um, pages start switching, painting their logo pink. Uh, and then this is again main, uh, gender mainstreaming, also important social innovation. So the journalism community knows that if they uh, ask something that reflects a, a social discord or social tension or a disagreement uh, versus one account, like there's plenty of mass supply, versus another uh, account, like if this pink is not, no, of no use, uh, the CECC will take that into account and make uh, policy changes or at least amplifying innovations uh, in a way that is to the public benefit. So again, the agenda setting power relies firmly on the social sector and the journalism community. But if you don't have a strong and robust uh, journalism community, then uh, there's n no one to keep the um, command centers honest. Uh, and then there will be a lot more um, power 
invested into the centralized uh, state and then say surveillance becomes a norm. Of course, there are also certain jurisdictions that are saying, you know, neither the social sector or the state is strong enough. We need to uh, believe in multinational companies and the economic sector. That is, of course, one possible way out uh, as well. But whether it's social sector, economic sector, or the state uh, taking the initiative of data controllership, that would probably shape the norm of data retention and data policy uh, for years, if not decades, after the coronavirus. So I think this is the most important thing to learn from Taiwan is that it is possible to make the democracy function even more deeply and make the people's sense of quality and supporting each other even more strong, uh, even during a pandemic and not at expense of the civil society and the essential liberties. So eight people would like to ask, the digital ministry has done a good job of preventing COVID-19 infodemic with misinformation. How was this done? So this is good question and, and, and with three minutes probably the last question that I'll answer. Um, so again, I, I talk about humor over rumor uh, and this is um, important both in the delivery of the information because it needs to be uh, very informative and succinct and also packaging of the information, meaning that it needs to be genuinely very funny. So another example is this one, uh, which is my favorite example. Uh, so our premier, Su Zhen Chang, um, laughing happily in this shot, now shows this bottom, uh, wiggling it a little bit, uh, and with this very large title uh, say, that says, um, um, we only have one pair of Botox each. Uh, in, right. So, uh, and, and this entire uh, package uh, is shaped like a tissue paper box, um, you'll notice. And uh, this uh, info box uh, shows that because there was panic buying of tissue papers at that time, um, the, the rumor, the, the trending rumor at that time, was that because we're ramping up production of medical masks from 1.8 million a day to 18 million a day, we're, 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 we've passed that point, by the way, we're almost 20 million a day now. So uh, because we're ramping up production a lot, it will use a lot of materials. And the materials, the solid rumor says, are the same as the one that's uh, being used to, to do uh, tissue paper production. Uh, so because tissue paper uh, is the same material, so it will soon run out of tissue paper that's the payload of the uh, rumor. And of course, the clarification says that the tissue paper material came from South America uh, and medical mask material come domestically. So there's no way that uh, ramping up production of this will influence the supply of that. But if we just publish this table, it will not have a good R0 value and people will see uh, the, the rumor much more frequently uh, than uh, this clarification. So the humorous packaging is very important because people who have seen um, the premier Wiggling his buttons, uh, we will not easily unsee that. Uh, and, and so, uh, when you see the rumor afterwards, you will uh, just laugh at it. You will not feel uh, outraged. Uh, and because the same um, kind of psychological potential for uh, being um, upset and w willing to share something could be channeled to outrage or you could be channeled to humor. But these two uh, channels are mutually exclusive. If you feel strongly outrage, there's no way to feel humor. And if you already laughed about it, there's no way to feel outrage. Uh, and so after this very humorous packaging, actually we, we noticed that the original rumor just died down uh, in a couple of days and people don't panic buy tissue paper and more. Uh, and there's also this part that says that if you uh, spread this uh, this information intentionally uh, if to cause public harm, there is actually counter disinformation uh, law already in place. So we found out that the person who spread this disinformation the first time was a tissue paper reseller. So um, in, in conclusion, I think humor over rumor relies on a creative um, social sector that can take each and every CECC uh, spokes dog meme, for example, but it's about social distancing, indoor, three dogs, outdoor, two dogs. Uh, remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing, not doing those things, and um, do not um, eat your hands <laughs> during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, and also remember to pre-order uh, your masks. And so all this uh, show the creativity of the civil society, and people do do love this Dong Chai or Dong CEO, and we see that people across all the different age groups do their own secondary and 
chittery uh, recreations, remixes using those uh, doga memes so that everybody now know how to wash your hands properly and how to measure social distance. And so I would encourage you to also help, I guess, uh, in spreading the humor. Uh, whenever you see a, a rumor or something that appears to outreach, think about how you can transform it into a more pro-social way so we have a pro-social media rather than anti-social media. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Audrey Tan gave us many wonderful and interesting examples. That's uh, thank her. Uh, she must leave by 2.40. Thank you. Thank you. We take a short break, 10 minutes, and then come back.